We've taken you into some details and showed you some of the advanced instruments we use to solve a specific problem. In this case, get the general idea and then to solve a P0171. What I want to do now is talk about the measurements. Now, measurements can be made with different instruments or tools so that it is necessary for you to understand the value of displaying data in different ways. Now, sometimes terminology can get confusing. We'll try to cover that terminology. But we're going to measure the same signal occasionally with different tools to examine the information available to each tool. Why do we want to change from a basic voltmeter to a lab scope? What additional information is available if we make this change? So this is the concept of this section. We're going to cover a wide variety of things and then go back and look at specific things later on. Let's start with plain DC voltage, just to get some of this terminology out of the way. It's electrical current which flows in one direction through a circuit. It flows from minus to plus. It's like visualizing water flowing in one direction inside a pipe. It's almost exclusively used in any low voltage mobile electronic application. We don't use it in household electrical, and we'll tell you why later. AC voltage, alternating current, is the flow of electrons which constantly change direction. Part of a cycle, they go one direction. The next half cycle, they go to the other. AC voltage is alternating current. It takes turns alternating of being positive and negative. It quickly changes direction as defined by its frequency measured in hertz. As an example, the residential power grid is usually 50 to 60 hertz, which means the voltage and current change direction 50 or 60 times per second. Now you say, why is this important? AC voltage is used with transformers. Transformers can convert power into high voltage, low current, step it down into low voltage, high current. It was perfected by Westinghouse and Tesla. Tesla came to Westinghouse and said, we can distribute high voltage electricity over wires at very low current by using transformers and change the whole electrical industry. This is what it looks like. It starts from zero then goes up to a positive, back down to zero, down to a negative, turns around, goes to zero, back to a positive, back down to a negative, uh, to zero again, and on down to a negative. And it continues to repeat this. It reaches its maximum opposite directions, turns around, and goes the other way. This passes through a transformer readily. It allows AC voltage to be at high voltage for distribution, bring it down to low voltage, high current at a household or for residential use. The reason for this is the current flow through the wire has losses. So if we raise the voltage extremely high, power stays in proportion. Current will be extremely small. So small current has low losses. So this is why AC is used. We're going to use specialized functions of this in the automobile. The number of times it completes one cycle for standard AC it starts at zero, goes to a maximum, comes through zero, goes to a max negative, comes back to zero. That's one cycle. We count the number of times this happens in one cycle. There's some other ways we measure frequency, but this is the common one we do it. Now, we can take a digital multimeter, and we can use frequency. We're taking a GM3800 here. We're going to take our voltmeter and put on pin J coming out of the cam sensor. With the voltmeter set on frequency, We'll read 7 to, hertz, 7 to 8 hertz at idle. At 55 miles an hour, it'll be up to around 14 to 16 hertz. What this tells us is we have a signal. Does it tell us if it's synchronized to the engine at the right location? No. We know nothing about its relation to others. All we know is the signal at this point, in reference to ground, has a frequency. If we move up here and move at the 18x, we can say, wow, 18x at idle. It's got 190 to 230 hertz. At 55, it's got 380 to 460 hertz. Again, this just tells us we have a frequency. It's doing something. If we want to take this another level, we need to go to a lab scope. With a lab scope pattern, we have both of them here. In fact, we don't have we have an 18x and a 3x here. But we've got lines here. We can see it. Do we have all the 18x signals present? Yes. Are they turning off and on? Is there excessive noise? No. 
Do we know the duty cycle? Can we see the shape and the quality of the product? Yes. So we get to see the quality of things. Here's a Ford. Same thing. We've got a digital frequency on our voltmeter. Frequency says 440 to 490, 870 to 900. But let's take Ford a step further. We're integrating cam and crankshaft. The long, slow one there in the middle that only has one sine wave. That's the camshaft. The one that's switching back and forth frequently, that's the crankshaft. Now what we're doing is this is from Thompson Labs. They're showing us how to evaluate Ford cam timing. What is the relationship of the camshaft timing to the crankshaft timing? If you'll notice, right at zero, we start up on our cam signal, and by 20 degrees, it's reached its max positive. That's identifying the number one on top dead center. Now that happens the fourth signal after the large pulse that happens because of the missing tooth on Ford. On the left, at the minus 50 degree point, we're coming off of a large signal. That says we are there crossing an identifiable point on the crankshaft. Four pulses later, one, two, three, four, we see the starting of the rise of the camshaft. That intersection is the cam timing. That's the relationship to each other. As we change cam timing, we find this moves. Retarding cam timing moves it to the right. Advancing it moves it to the left. Cam is opening before it normally would in relation to zero. This is how we judge the action of a cam sensor. This type of information isn't available with a voltmeter. We must see it visually because the timed value of information is important. That's what we're trying to show here. Just to take another one, here's a Chrysler. We have our digital multimeter readings, and then we have readings for the cam. We put the two together. Again, it's showing us cam and crank timing. And we won't go into all this. We have programs that go in-depth in this and talk about it, but we don't need to go into all that depth right now. We just want you to understand it. We have solved numerous problems because we could find noisy or missing signals on a sensor that wasn't absolutely dead, which is hard to find. When we look at signals, one of the other things we talk about is duty cycle. In duty cycle, there's two things we can measure. We can measure the high side duration or the positive side. That's called high side duty cycle. Or we can measure negative duration, the low side duty cycle. It's sometimes called minus duty cycle and plus duty cycle. Right now, the high side and the low side occupy the same percentage of the scale. And I got a 50% duty cycle. That's what 50% duty cycle looks like. It doesn't matter which one we're using, high side or low side. Well, why would we use high side and low side? Here's an example. This is the variable valve timing solenoid on a Ford. It's going to use ground to activate and to modify the variable valve timing by duty cycling this variable valve timing solenoid. So it is going to be using a low side signal in order to duty cycle it. A hundred percent means it's on all the time using low side. If we had high side switching, like a GM variable valve timing control, just to pick two opposite ones, it's got high side driver. It's going to be on to turn the solenoid on to change cam timing. At a 100% duty cycle, we'll be at 12 volts. Let me back up and say that again. At a 100% duty cycle here, we're near zero volts. At a 100% duty cycle here, we're at battery voltage or 12 volts. See the difference? We need to know which one we're working with. Here is 20% duty cycle looking at the negative duration. Of course, it's the opposite if we look at the positive. We'll talk about that later. Here's t positive duration of 20%. It's shifted around. We're high 20% of the time, low 80%. Here we are, same thing, looking at the same pattern, only now we're looking at the negative duration, and we're 80%. If we're 80% on the positive, it would look just the opposite. We'd be high most of the time and low rest. Now, if I take this signal and read DC average voltage. I'm going to read about, it's reading right now 12 volts at max, zero volts at minimum. I've got 80% of 12 volts. So I'm going to read about 
9.6 volts, I'd read it's the average voltage. Does the 9.6 volts tell me anything? Well, it would tell me I've got a signal that's changing. It's not battery voltage all the time. If I then switch to duty cycle and said it's 80% positive duty cycle, 20% negative duty cycle, I could add the two together and say, yeah, well, they're mostly positive, somewhat negative. I can't draw a picture like I can with a lab scope. Let's talk about some other things we're going to measure. Diodes. We, these are things we're going to talk about and run into when we get more complicated circuitry. Diodes allow electricity to flow in one direction only. Diodes are electrical check valves. The check valve that you put pressure one way and blocks it from coming back. That's what this does. We use diodes in the alternator to convert AC into DC. It passes the positive in the direction of the arrow. So the arrow on this symbol shows us the direction in which it will pass a positive. If we take these and put them on an AC signal and take a group of them and they point this way, they'll all be pointing to positive and we can take AC voltage and turn it into DC. That's what we do at our alternator. Forward voltage drop is a small amount it takes to go through the diode. It's not usually not that high. It's usually about 7 tenths of a volt. Some special diodes are slightly lower. We're not going to worry too much about this. Here's a visual. At the top, when the positive is on the right, going the opposite direction, pushing against the arrow, it's blocked. At the bottom, we're going with the arrow and it passes it from positive to the negative so we can have current flow. At the top, we can't have any current flow because the positive is blocked. It cannot attract electrons. That's the bottom line. Now to do this with a voltmeter, we've got to have a battery inside and a current limiting resistor. It's real simple. We're going to take this internal battery and we're going to hook it to the diode and we're going to measure the voltage. Right now we're reading 0.692 volts. We're actually going to use voltage to check these. It's better than using an ohm meter. Let's go see how we do that. We're going to take our meter, which remember has a battery inside that's going to supply power for our diode test. We're going to hook up to the diode and when the positive is on the right side and the arrow is pointing to the left, we have 5.67 volts. That's the voltage we have as a voltage drop across this diode when it's forward biased with an internal resistor. If we swap the leads, it goes off scale because we've blocked the voltage and it's gone higher than normal. It's an open circuit. Here's what it looks like when we look at the two of them. When we reverse bias, we get an overload. When we're forward biased, we can see it. So this is the way we test it. And we're using 2.5 volts to do this test. So when 2.5 volts are applied and the positive lead is pointed to the arrow, we have a voltage drop of 0.567 volts, under 700 millivolts, which is what we said we're looking for. Here's why we use it. We see things like this circuit down at the bottom with the AC compressor clutch. We've got a diode in there to keep this clutch solenoid from creating large voltage spikes. When it tries to create a large voltage spike, it bypasses it around this diode and keeps it from causing noise and other problems in the electrical system. So we use it in a number of different places. We used it earlier as a steering diode in our one-touched ignition system that blocked the voltage so we could see the difference between the motor speed in charge, the smart junction box being in charge of enabling the starter. There's some other electrical units we need to talk about and talk about them. Mega. M is 1 million. 80 mega ohms is 8 million ohms. Kilo. K is 1,000. 20 kilovolts is 20,000 volts. Milli is going the opposite direction. It's little m, and it is 0 0.001 or 1 thousandth of a volt. 50 millivolts is 50 one thousandths of a volt. Then we have micro. Mu is the symbol for that, and it is 1 millionth. 25 microamps is 25 one millionths of an amp. Nano is even smaller. It's one billionth. So 20 billionths of an amp or volt would be a very small signal. Now, we don't want to go far from being in automotive circuits. Now that we've learned about some of these new measurement techniques, let's go utilize some of these measurements. Let's use some of this terminology and look at real automotive circuits.